ladies and gentlemen. Welcome gentlemen to, and ladies. Oh, welcome to Tommy and Andy. I'm Cryptic. And I'm Puzzle. There you go. Thank you for... I, I was really wondering if you were going <laughs> to... We spent like three hours rehearsing that before we hit record. <laughs> Actually, I just... I, I, I was feeling like that was improv, honestly, but you know, I'm not very good at that, so... Welcome. Heck yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's the podcast with po- podcast or something. I don't know what this is. It's a show. It's a thing. It's it's a podcast. You know, we I actually I didn't know this, but the definition of podcast is changing because podcasts apparently used to be like defined by the fact that you could get them through an RSS feed. But like now YouTube has like a whole podcast section, which is like just audio. So well, you know where that weird. You know where the pod part of podcast came from, right? Yeah, from iPod. Yeah, that was it. Was legitimately just like, hey, you want to listen to a radio show on your on your cool device that you got in the two thousands? Yo, remember scroll wheel controls to dude? Not gonna lie, that's still a pretty good way to move through vertical menus. I feel like say. we. I feel like this generation has like lost the and now we're just on a tangent <laughs> <You're> just, so <welcome. laughs> and the children they just don't get it <laughs> no listen they grew up i think in a sad time where like there's not like the love of hardware that we have because i remember like the ipod and i remember holding it and i remember it like feeling special in my hands and like interface of it was like unique specifically and now every device is just this amalgamation of like the same thing like that's slightly rectangular different glass other slab things. done yes the yes end. and even like you could bring it to like the game boy and the game boy advance that was like such a special piece of hardware and like we don't have that that angle of technology as much anymore yeah it's all different now anyways this is undertale <laughs> Which you it could not sure play is. on an iPod, as far as I'm aware. Maybe you can. I bet you it's like Doom. I bet you you could put it on like anything. Well, considering it's a pretty simple game maker game, and it did get ported to a bunch of stuff, uh, it would take some work, but I bet you could. Uh, anyway, yeah, so this is Undertale, a game that came out in 2015, made uh, almost entirely by one man, Toby Fox, uh, with some support from, from some friends and everything, and later on... Uh, a bunch of support staff doing ports to other platforms uh, because it originally just came out on PC. This was a Kickstarter game that I don't think it like super blew up like when it was a Kickstarter. I don't think people were crazy excited for it or anything like that. But it came out and it kind of took the world by storm. At least that's what it felt like. Um, This game came out right after I graduated college. Yep. So... It was one of those things where people started talking about it, and as I just mentioned to Andy, I actually got majorly spoiled on this game uh, prior to actually playing it, and it's one of a handful of games that I would say, if at all possible, if it matters to you uh, in the least about spoilers, to go in as blind as possible. So, hey, if you've never played this game before and you're interested in it, just go... Don't listen to what I have to say about it. It's really good. It's one of my favorite games of all time, like top five all time. And that is why I wanted to talk about it on the podcast. Yeah, honestly, even if you're not interested in this game at all, turn this off and go give it a shot because I promise you will fall in love with it in some way. Like this this game is, there's there's a reason that this game took the entire world by storm and like has like an entire insanely huge dedicated following online and and everywhere and like you know what's actually unique too is um this game took the world by storm with kids even like it's pretty rare to find kids that are like 10 or younger or even in like high school that like they've all heard of undertale or they've heard the music and a lot of them have played it which is kind of like i feel like you don't see that as much with like pop culture in the same way now like you have like stranger things and you have like undertale (laughs) those are like the two things that you can be like every kid knows these two things other than that it's a total crapshoot i don't know i think they just they mostly like the Fortnite and the skibbity toilet now um they love the scooby-doo toilet dude it's their favorite but but um (laughs) yeah it's 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 very I'll, i'll say this um i've had a lot to say about fandoms and stuff in the past and as it turns out when you just engage with a group of ravenous fans for a long time and there's a lot of them some of them end up being you know not the greatest 
and I think Undertale has one of the most terminally online fan bases of anything that's ever existed, and I'm not a big fan of it, so sorry everyone who I would just, like, upset right now, but, like, you gotta, like, chill on the internet sometimes. Just relax. It's not a big deal. But along those lines, because Undertale uh, has such a terminally online fan base, there's an incredible number of fan games and stuff that exist uh, to the point where I just remembered that Undertale Yellow came out like a year ago and I never played it. And so I probably will need to do that after this. Um, We'll talk about what that is a little bit later because there's those touches of spoilers. So I... Uh, Annie and I were talking about this before. We're probably going to try and keep the beginning of this as close to spoiler-free as you reasonably can, uh, but that's probably not going to last too long because, man, oh, man, there's a lot of stuff in this game technically like a spoiler. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, really, like, basically from Go, this game is filled with spoilers. And I think that's because that speaks a lot to the fact that this game is is just such a unique experience from the first minute to the last minute that like ev- every scene is like a spoiler in the sense that like every scene is like this unique little experience or has some funny joke or some something to it. So it, it really is an adventure that's worth just experiencing on your own terms, like on your first playthrough completely blind. Yeah. So I guess to talk about what Undertale is, is it's a, a very, kind of primitive looking, um, pixely, um, RPG, uh, that is very, 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 very heavily like earthbound vibes inspired. Uh, there is a lot of fan games and stuff that, or I I don't even necessarily want to call them fan games. I guess things that have been heavily inspired by that have been released as like just these homebrew type games, uh, There's like the Lisa the Painful Games and blah, blah, blah. All these kinds of things that all pull from the the kind of odd, bizarre, quirky, some weird specific type of charm that Earthbound had all the way back in the day uh, in the Mother series uh, that people just really, 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 really loved and hung on to for a long time uh, to the point, Andy, where I don't know if you knew this, but... um, Toby Fox is famous for a couple of things prior to Undertale. One of his, uh, he was one of the big contributors for, I shouldn't say big contributor. He was a contributor to Homestuck, which was like some online multimedia thing that you are not an online enough person to probably even know what that is. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, It's a very strange thing that I never was personally into, but a lot of people really uh, enjoyed it for a long time. Uh, and that's actually where a version of the song Megalovania comes from. Mm, and the, yeah, I did know that. And the original version of Megalovania was actually uh, from an Earthbound ROM hack that Toby Fox did that was Halloween-themed yep. way, way, way back in the day. And the part that was so impressive about um, him having Megalovania in that game is prior to his release of that ROM hack, people didn't know how to change the music or the sounds. So he did some weird backwards hack thing to basically get it to play the megalovania song in the game when people hadn't really figured out how to do that yet which is neat Mm. Um, yeah so that is the weird origin of that song which is great um so it's not even an undertale original thing uh but the undertale version of that song is by far the best one in my opinion yeah yeah so so yeah i mean yeah so (sighs) just yeah like undertale is like an rpg um but i guess the the sort of hook or the twist of it is that um you know in most rpgs you you fight things and you uh gain experience and you level up but you play as this small gender neutral child who has fallen into the underground um and the underground is filled with monsters for a lot of, you know, story reasons that you find out later in the lore of the world. But basically, um, you, with every encounter in the game, it's broadcast to you pretty early on that you can fight monsters or you can try and engage with them by talking with them. Um, and sort of have this, this puzzle, puzzle focused approach to engaging monsters and figuring out how you can mercy them to, uh, flee combat. So, it sort of takes the blueprint of what is a traditional turn-based RPG and flips it on its head. And uh, I would say you're encouraged. Like, a lot of people play this game and they're like, oh, I didn't even know that you should be mercying monsters. But I think they make it really clear to you because Toriel, who we're seeing now, 
tells you in your first encounter, like, try talking to the monster and see what happens. You can show them mercy if you want. And that's kind of the premise of this game that, that the entire story and lore and everything we're going to talk about hinges on that uh, premise, that idea. Yeah, um, it absolutely. And we've already, if, if you're watching the video of the podcast, uh, th- we've already seen her kind of explain that you can do that. And there's, there's a little dummy and you talk to it and it says, you talk to the dummy. It doesn't seem much for conversation. And then she kind of <laughs> just, the battle just sort of ends at that point. Uh, I don't know if you knew this. There is an alternate way to end that fight without hurting the dummy. Uh, you, can you just go like right to mercy or something? Or you just I, I, I knew- you just keep swinging at it with the fight. And so when you hit the fight commands, uh, you have to basically do like a little timing mini game. And depending on the weapon you have, it'll change. Like you have to hit it as it goes across the middle for the maximum amount of damage. But if you just don't hit the button, you will miss. So if you just swing at the dummy and miss like a dozen times in a row, <laughs> eventually the game is like, uh, okay, let's move on. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> Amazing. That and that that like exact thing speaks to like why this game is so hilarious and brilliant because he thought of every possible scenario that you might try, which is insane. Yeah. And that's, that's really the thing that is truly special about undertale to me is it is one of the handful of things, uh, that I can think of in terms of just art in general, where the fact that undertale is a video game is critical to why it is what it is and what makes it good. Um, Andy, uh, is a very big house of leaves fans. The point where the man, the man has it, uh, etched onto his body house of leaves is a book that could only ever be a book you know yes uh yes. you you could not make house of leaves specifically an adaptation into another medium without fundamentally changing what it is and undertale is another one of those things you can make stuff inspired by it of course but it's never going to be what this is in any other medium yes the fact that you are a player with agency that makes choices is is a huge part of the game. And if you take that away, it it doesn't make any sense anymore. (laughs) Yep. And we can get into how that sort of, uh, you know, delves into some meta aspects of the plot and stuff. Minor, minor spoilers, but can I, before we get too deep into it, can I, can I talk a little bit about like my personal history with this game? Yes, please do. Cause I don't know if I know this actually, this will probably be new for me too. Well, I you do actually, but like okay. I, I don't know if I've ever said it out loud so blatantly. But so like you said, this game came out when you graduated from college and I graduated the following year. Um and actually you showed me this game and you came over and you showed me this game and it was uh shortly after I had uh this awful, awful ta- tailbone surgery where I had to get huge chunks of my body removed. That Um, is when that happened. Oh, okay. You're right. It's starting to come together now. Go on. (laughs) Yeah. And so you came over and I literally like I had to lay on my stomach like for like four weeks or something. Like I couldn't sit for six to eight weeks because my tailbone was destroyed, which was like a horrifically depressing like time in my life. Um, And up until... Up until like this moment where I had played Undertale, I really hadn't played video games for maybe the last like four years. Like, and graduating from college, I was kind of like, ah, I'm not really into video games anymore. Like, I used to like them when I was a kid, but whatever. Um, but you came over and showed me this game, and I bought it for like eight dollars or some ridiculous value price. And, uh, you know, had nothing else to do because I was stuck laying on my stomach and I played the heck out of this game and adored it. And like, to be honest with you, looking back almost like 10 years now, I don't think I think had that moment not happened, I may have like really never gotten into video games in a big way again, at least not for a long time. But this game, it really meant a lot to me and it it changed my perspective and it really brought me like hope in a time when I was really like suffering and depressed. Um, and play, I think I played it like two times back to back. And then I watched 
the game grumps play it and i i've like i have really like from beginning to the end of this game i've probably seen it through on a stream or a video or played it myself like 10 plus times because it it just like to me is like this really really meaningful heartfelt piece of work that like it really like changed me like and it's still it's still like if i have people that are like oh i don't know a lot about video games i'm like play undertale it's like a meaningful piece of art in my mind so anyway and that's thanks to you and here we are talking about it like 10 years later that's crazy i'm not gonna lie i didn't realize like like obviously now that you're saying this of like putting the timing together of that i didn't realize that it was the thing that maybe got you back into video games again so cool well you're yeah. welcome i think maybe yeah, super, or not depending super. on your perspective about <laughs> video games in general i guess um, I mean, we're doing a podcast on the internet about it, so probably good, but you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, like it proves, I think to people like to me at the time and to people who don't know a lot about video games or don't play them, it, to me, it proves that games can be like really meaningful, moving pieces of art in the way people traditionally think of like songs or movies i think a lot of people write off video games as just like you're gonna play mario and have a good time but like to me this is like something that uh has like changed my perspective and i think everyone i know who's played it or talked about it is it feels the same way so this game's awesome yeah uh this game kind of on every level for for as simple as it is i think that's what its entire strength is, is it has a very, very kind of specific goal and a message and an idea about what it is and who you are playing the game. And it simply executes on all of those things. And it's a very incredibly cohesive vision, despite the fact that part of that vision is I have to think of every single thing that every person is going to try in this scenario. And I have to account for every single one of those contingencies. And it is... I'm I'm struggling to think of even one thing that I did that I was like, I wonder what'll happen if you do this and didn't get a reaction. I don't know if I can think of one single thing in this entire game that didn't at least give me some little minor tweak to dialogue somewhere or whatever it is. There's a bazillion things in this game that exist like that that I've never seen because how could I ever possibly uh, account for all those things? There is a couple of things. So we uh, we both replayed this recently. Um, it's the first time I had played this game in a number of years now. Um, and I did a couple of things. So that um, missing the dummy a bunch of times to get that initial fight, that was, I was just like, I just want to see what happens. And as it turns <laughs> out, you move on. You know, I had never done that before. I <laughs> The game came out in 2015. I played it. I haven't played it in years, but when I was playing it, I think I went through this game um, in a specific um, route uh, through the story probably at least half a dozen times, like just back to back to back to back to back. Just played it over and over again because I was like, I can't believe how much I adore this cute little pixel game um, about about this child uh, in the underground talking to monsters and making friends with them. It's great. Yeah yeah it, it, and uh i'm trying to think of what the moment was for me like i think every playthrough i've had this one included there's something that you're like oh i didn't know that happened if you if you said that particular diet like and without trying because i've definitely had the playthroughs where you're like i wonder what happens if i press this button and do this prompt and whatever like there's always something like that in this game you haven't tried but like in recent playthroughs, I don't even try to do that. I just play the game and see what happens. And there's always a couple things that you're like, oh, I didn't even know that, that that that's the prompt that you give if you do this out of order or whatever the heck, you know? Yeah, once we start to get deeper into a little bit more spoilery territory talking about uh, plot events, I do want to talk about um, a couple of things. Uh, another one of which I was like, I didn't know that you could do that in this point uh, and have that work and continue on through the way that I was intending on playing. And it totally did. Uh, it's really, it's really just neat how you can, you are intended to play this game however you want. I'll say yeah. of, I mentioned the fandom before I'm being online. I feel like there's a lot of people that, um, 
it's sort of the the internet and the streamer thing about like you go and you see somebody else playing the game because you want them to enjoy the thing that you enjoyed a lot and inexplicably most people's version of doing that is actually to tell them like no no no, no you have to do it the way that I did it otherwise you did it wrong and you're probably not going to like it the same way or as much as I did and that's just that's really not true. <laughs> and I um, agree with those people wholeheartedly. Oh. oh, oh. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, also, this game isn't particularly long, so the idea of you going through it and then being like, oh, what if I just wanted to do something different on another playthrough? That is, um, I think, expected. I don't think the intention was for you to play this game in one specific way and that's the only way you were supposed to play it um the game's got a lot to say about the stuff that you do in the game and it does not forget at any point it's rather remarkable i don't know exactly how he came up with doing it but it's it's really impressive yeah and i think too like the game th there's a specific moment that we'll talk about where the game broadcasts to you that it that it knows that you've made choices and is going to explicitly respond to all of the choices you make. And I think that that is that important moment that the game is telling you, maybe you should try a bunch of stuff and see what happens. Like, I think that I think that's kind of Toby Fox saying to you out loud, every choice you make and every order you do stuff is going to change your outcome. So go crazy, press all the buttons and see what happens. So I agree with you that, I mean, like, I think there is an intended experience it, in big quotes. Like, I think there is one, one. Oh, there, there, like here's, there absolutely is the, the primary intended experience. And we'll get deeper into that later on, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't even know if, uh, intended experience is the right word but there's definitely sort of like a canon a canon way to play the game you know that's like the sort of accepted way but yes the whole the whole idea that you get all of these different outcomes and changes is like the, the entire identity of the game so to tell people to play it one way is pretty silly yeah so I guess uh, the one thing that we didn't talk about, so we talked about the combat and how you can theoretically fight people and you can uh, try and talk to them or basically do, it's not necessarily always talking, it'll sometimes be like silly little actions that are specific to whatever monster it is. So actually if you see on screen right now, uh, to the to little jiggly man, the mold small over there, uh, it was like imitate and flirt were the options rather than speak. And there is a... <laughs> There is a correct way, basically, to deal with all of the individual things. Sometimes there's a handful of different ways to basically get them to the point where they want to spare you and you can go to the mercy thing and end the battle. You don't get any um, EXP. You'll get some money from it because you will have uh, some stuff that you can buy in the game. Uh, but yeah, you won't be like leveling up if you play the game that way. Um, and that's how I always play the game now. That is decidedly not how you have to. Um, in any way, right, shape, or right. form. But to me, it's a thing that's more unique about the combat system, and that is just more interesting to do. So to me, I think I think you're kind of incentivized to do that because otherwise this combat system is like, man, I can't even imagine what like some boss encounters and stuff would be like if you just were like, I'm just going to fight them straight up. I feel like it would be super easy. I, I Yeah, I think... Um... I think there are moments where he like I think there are moments where the game like expects you to get impatient and just and just start swinging. Um probably yes. And I'm tr I'm trying to remember which which one specifically, but there were there was one boss encounter where I it was just like, "Oh, you know what? I do know what it is." There, we'll there's talk definitely about it in a like a while. Yeah, but there's definitely moments where they like expect you to kind of like be tempted with like, oh man, this is getting too hard and it's taking too long the way it is, and I'm gonna just fight. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think the 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 way they broadcast, the way that uh, Toriel broadcasts to you to play the game, which is to figure out the quirks of each monster and figure out how to mercy them, is. I mean, I think it's the most fun way to play the game, and it also makes it sort of a like like a puzzly RPG <laughs> because your choices uh, and, and how you decide to approach the monsters and, and respond to them is how you defeat them, which is, it's just fun. It's a unique take on combat. Yeah. 
I'm keeping an eye on what's happening in the video right now because at a certain point, the video is going to start to run right into some of the spoilery things that I think we'll want to talk about. So we might want to begin to transition um, shortly. Yeah. Uh, The other thing that I do want to talk about, I'll I'll start now and I'm going to bring it up again uh, a different uh, or a number of times during this. I know this. there's no other sound happening right now. This is one of the greatest video game soundtracks that's ever been made. I was talking about one song earlier, but just the whole thing, I, I really struggle to think of other soundtracks that are as complete and diverse as this tiny little short pixel game. Um, and man, every, every single song is incredible. Um, do, 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 the yes, the that do, main do, that main theme do. falling down, all of that. Um, the the home song that would normally be playing right now is very peaceful. Um, everything that's in the ruins before, where it just starts with uh, the piano melody, and then you're immediately hit with the other piano counter melody. The first time that song played, I was like, "Whoa!" And that's like first five minutes of the game kind of thing. The Ruins song starts. That was my uh, ringtone actually for quite a long time just because of it, it's, I, I love it so dearly. Um, yeah, it, I was like, wow, I wasn't anticipating something that's like, you know, it's not like crazy time signatures, blah, blah, blah. But it was like, there's interesting structure and ideas and melodies and progressions all over the place in this game. I don't know how Toby Fox got to learn all the things that he does. I assume that he just is like one of those like, yeah, I don't know. I was like self-taught at everything. And somehow he just like understands music because <laughs> that's what it feels like to me, at least it's yeah. very DIY, very, um, honestly, I think you've said this before, just like in terms of like the prolificness of like, how in the world did this guy just do this? Like Koji Kondo style. Like, yeah, he was just like a dude at Nintendo, who then wrote, like, all of the most iconic music for most of their most famous franchises, like Mario and Zelda. <laughs> it's 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 just bonkers. Like, yeah, I don't know. It was just... I just kind of came up with it. Yeah, I think... I think the... My biggest takeaway this playthrough in... He did kind Punch of like Out 2? A- oh, I didn't know that, Richard. That's amazing. Oh, my God. That's crazy. <laughs> That's nuts. Um, I think the thing that I've come to understand about this game and all of the stuff in it, and maybe Toby Fox, is that, like, I think there's two really important things for me that makes this game hit in a really, really strong way is um, less is more in in like everything in the art in the dialogue in the number of characters this game is like a lesson on minimalism because like i don't know how many how many characters do you encounter in this game compared to any other rpg like a third but like instead of filling the game with so much stuff that it all becomes watered down every single like room and pixel and character is memorable because they're like this unique thing that stands on its own um and i think the music is the same way like the music is so minimalistic like so much of it is so unbelievably simple but he just has this way of like finding that one melody or that one chord progression that stands really really strong on his on its own and like not filling it with fluff and complicated stuff but finding the core of something that's gonna like hit you in the feels and presenting it in the most simple way possible and i think that that's like the entire reason this game works and is so effective i think uh, yeah, I I agree. Um, the emotional gut punch thing. Um, we're gonna get to that a little bit later. Um, I think you talked about like specific moments in this game. There is there's a handful of moments in this game, but I was there's a moment uh, part way pretty deep into the game actually. I'll say um, that I I sat and I went. Why am I so upset about these little pixel animal monster people right now? <laughs> What's happening? Why am I crying over that? I, I don't, I generally don't know if I had ever 
like just kind of unexpectedly started crying while playing a video game before that moment in this game because I was uh, very taken aback and the music's a huge part of that. Um, the extensive use of the leitmotif thing, which is one of my favorite things uh, that has been done like in lots and lots of uh, games from like the 90s, Final Fantasy and uh, Nobuo Uematsu, uh, very, very, very famous for using just those leitmotif for different characters, blah, blah, blah. And he knows about all that stuff better than I do because he's actually a musician for real. Um, but yeah, it's it's really, I don't know. The, the, as you said, these minimal things, like you hear a familiar melody um, with slightly different voicing in a slightly different context and it will change the entire mood of what's happening in the scene dramatically because you'll begin to link the things that you are mentally supposed to be linking when you heard that melody again. It's very, very, very effective. Yeah. There, there's just such a, there's just such a simplicity in that like every character in every room and every, every like little story scenario is like this uniquely handcrafted thing. Um, but it's because it's so simple, it's all just boiled down to the most effective way to tell that little that little scene or the most effective way to present this melody. Like, there's there's just no fluff to it. It just hits. Yeah. All right, Andy. I think it's time for us to start to get into spoiler territory here. So, oh, it's time. It, we go into the basement and spoilers spoilers are happening. Yeah. So uh, if you're if you're listening to this um, and you have interest in this game based on us talking about it with with kind of really minor spoilers, this is the point where it's going to start to get a little heavier into like, all right, this is what this game is really saying and what's going on in it and blah, blah, blah. And I implore you, you should experience it for yourself. Um, I was spoiled on this game and it didn't ruin it for me, but I am a person who generally speaking uh, cares a lot less about that than I think most people do. Um, and I still wonder if I would feel even stronger about this game had I not been spoiled before I played it for the first time. So last chance, yeah, yeah. do what you got to do. If you stay here because you don't think you're ever actually going to play it, so be it. Um, I still think playing this game, no matter what, is super worthwhile. And as Toriel said just now, uh, this is our final warning. So uh, you decide, so you have fallen down into the underground, and you're like, I got to go and do something. I got to leave here. I want to try and go home. And Toriel doesn't want you to leave. So right now she goes, all right, the only way you're going to leave is if you prove that you're strong enough to do it. So she starts a fight with you. And this is the moment. This is like the Undertale, the defining moment of Undertale right here because you are supposed to have learned, and there's actually a frog that tells you in the underground, but you are supposed to have learned that you have to wait her out with mercy and not not kill her. But the game kind of knows that you're going to get stuck and you're going to think the only way to get out here is to actually fight her and kill her. And so you do that. And then I actually don't know the next scene as well as, as you do, Tommy, but tell us what happens next after you kill goat mom. So, so if you, if you go and you, well, actually, so there's a few different ways that this can play out because as you said, you actually can not kill her. Um, as the game sort of intends, if you go through the act menu, which is generally speaking where you got to go to do things, you can try to talk to her or whatever, and you'll do it a number of times. And eventually the game will literally say, um, hey, you should try something different. Yeah, because it's talking because, to yeah, her talking doesn't, doesn't do anything. Yeah, this isn't going to work. You have to try something different. And they're right, because if you just continue to try to talk to her, you'll do it forever. Um I don't know if you'll be able to see it right now, but she's throwing attacks at you, and they, they gradually do less and less damage. And as you get really, really close to death, eventually her attacks just actually won't be targeting you, and you have to actively run into them to take damage. So this fight is almost impossible to lose unless you are trying to, because she doesn't want to hurt you. She just wants yeah. you to stay. Um, so if you if you don't put any of this together and you kill her... You go into the next room, uh, and if you were paying attention to the video before, there's a little flower guy named Flowey who tries to kill you, who she saves you from, who basically is just like, ah, ha, 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 you had to kill her, blah, 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 says a whole bunch of stuff. So you're like, all right, maybe I didn't have to do that. 
I'm gonna reload. Does he not tell you that you don't have he he doesn't say like I wonder if there was a way you could have done it without killing her? I think doesn't I think he, he does he, like he, he sort of implies that. Um most okay. he, mostly to make you feel bad, right? She's like, oh, this look at this thing you did. If only there was some other way. So the game deliberately baits you into being like, wait a minute, I'm playing a video game. Why don't I just load my save and not kill her? <laughs> so you can totally go and do that. You can absolutely go back and redo this fight and spare goat mom here. And that is ideally probably for a lot of people how that would go. Um, and here's so here's another thing. Uh, this was another one of the things where I had never done before. Remember when I said if you just swing and you miss at the dummy earlier, it will eventually end the fight. That works here too. And she oh, really? and she has a whole bunch of dialogue every time you miss about like what are you doing? Stop it! Stop! Fight me! <laughs> like over and over again. And eventually she's just like, okay, I get it. You don't want to fight me. Let's stop. Here, which is which is interesting. I wonder if you can mercy more fights that way than we think. Here's the thing: I genuinely don't know. I only tried it on these couple, and then I was so used to doing everything else the uh, the ways I've done it in the past. I guess that I mostly stuck with those. But but yeah, yeah. I wonder. I wonder if you figure that out early that you can like mercy a lot of enemies by doing that a few times, and then they're like, "Oh, I see." You actually don't want to fight me. I wonder if that's a thing. Yeah, I'm not really sure. There's definitely some Here's alternate a- ways to end some monster fights in this game um, that are silly sometimes. So, Here's a dumb question. I'm pretty sure, but there's no way to like exit that fight and somehow like get this to be the end, right? And be like, hey, Toriel, we live together now. And she's just like, cool, you're my, you're my goat kid. You can't do that, right? No. No, I don't believe so. Um, I think the closest thing you get to that, so there's a there's a fun joke little um, hard mode, in quotes, uh, that exists. Yes, which I've done. Yeah, uh, and I think that's the closest thing you get to that because it ends at the end of the ruins section, if I remember right. Yeah, it um, does. And it's, and it's not really truly a, a hard mode. It's just a fun little thing that's mostly implied that you would only ever know how to get there uh, by beating the game in full. So... It's one of those. It things. is hard though. Yeah, it, it, it's a little Easter egg thing. But anyway, back to um, we've reloaded our save. Um, I found my way of uh, swinging and missing at Toriel so that I don't actually have to kill her. Um, you go into the next room, and Flowey shows up again, and he goes, "I know exactly what you did. <laughs> I know you killed her before, and that you decided to undo it. It's really interesting that you have the ability to do that, isn't it?" And then he laughs and he disappears. And you're like, and, and you're like, like, what is going on <laughs> in this yeah. video game? And that was yeah. that was for me like that because I I did that. I I think I killed her the first time, and and then I spared her. And I was like, oh, got it. Oh oh oh, I think he's I yeah, think he's saying it right now. Oh no, he's yeah. he's doing the it's kill or be killed. Uh, you didn't kill her, oh, so yeah. ha ha. You spared the life of a single person. Yada yada yada. Yeah, Flow is kind of a jerk. Um, we'll get more into him later. Um, but yeah, so so as it turns out, um, the game will even acknowledge you safe scumming. So if you go and you do a whole bunch of terrible stuff and then you reload the game, the game will point it out in some way, shape, or form at some point that it knows that you did that because it's always saving flags somewhere about the actions that you're taking uh, and it's not just associated with their save file. It's like in system files somewhere. You can theoretically go and delete those things and blah, blah, blah. But like, who would do that? That's no fun. Yeah. And I think it's funny. I actually didn't have that moment because I just figured out to spare Toriel. But I think for 98% of people playing this game, that's like the light bulb moment that you go, oh, I'm playing something different than anything I've ever played in my whole life. Like, that is such a just a curiosity moment that like unlocks in your brain that you're like, Oh, the game knew that I killed someone and save scummed. Like what? There's gotta be something bigger going on here, yep. which is that's like the undertale moment. Yeah. So I don't know. Do you know the other, um, I'll call them unique things that can happen in the Toriel fight there. Uh, there's a couple unique ways for that fight to go. Uh, well, I think you can, 
I think you can flee, but that does that's probably not what you're talking about. Oh, you I mean, I know you can intentionally run into her stuff and die and she gets appalled. Yeah, there's there's like literally you see it for like one frame of her gasping and putting her hands over her mouth if she manages to kill you. Because you do you have to run into the stuff and they actively are trying to avoid you. Um yep. and you'll get the game over. But yes, there is there is a distinct specific animation of of her being like, Oh my god. Um, if you do that, which is really, really interesting. Um, and you can also mercy her like you would, like you can get her to the point of mercy where her text becomes yellow and then you can kill her anyway in one hit. That's probably what you're talking about. Uh, yep. Or, or there's the, uh, you, you hurt her enough where basically it gets to the point where you would do the mercy thing. Right. Um, and then, uh, you have the conversation with her and you just like keep doing the talk blah 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 talk 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 and then you hit her and she has some really nasty things to say about you when she realizes who and what you are for doing that <laughs> um yeah goat mom figures out who and what you are um if you do some 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 really cruel things like that so yeah the game the game is judging you actively all the time um <laughs> and that's kind of undertale's whole thing is um it is a critique of video games and the people who play them while also being a really kind of heartwarming story all on its own. And that to me is is really what's amazing about it. I can't think of anything else. I love like the it. conveniently shaped yes, lamp. Yes, the conveniently shaped lamp to hide like, behind. <laughs> like one of my favorite stupid bits. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it never makes me not laugh. But yes, it's it's kind of and you know, again, going back to the fact that this game is huge with kids. This game is probably like for like a lot of kids like a place to sort of like experiment with morality in like a way that I can imagine if you're like 8 and you're playing a game like this like it's probably like one of the first games or things you've ever experienced where you can like actively be a bad person and see how that feels and like do it over and try and do it the best way. Like it's, it, I, I don't know, just that angle of it is kind of interesting because we were like a lot older when we played it, but I wonder what it's like being that young and playing a game where you're like, I can murder everyone. Let's see how that feels. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm assuming you never have done it, Andy. But there is a specific playthrough of this game for for those who don't know, um, where the the whole game and the plot and everything, uh, if you go out of your way to kill stuff like all the time, there is actually a specific playthrough that ends up being just for that. And man, does the game judge you even harder the whole time from every angle. Um, and I would argue the ending of that playthrough is, why did you bother wasting your time doing this? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, we're we're in spoiler territory, so people yeah. do know about the genocide run, and if they yeah. don't, like, they're not listening. So, yeah, it's uh, it's an entirely different route with um, some different unique bosses and uh, all unique uh, cutscenes with everyone, and a specific ending that uh, basically makes the game functionally unplayable until you do a handful of specific things, including wait at a black screen for like fifteen minutes. <laughs> yeah and there's there's a lot of remarkable things about that but like until i saw someone do the genocide playthrough route i didn't realize like they make you work so hard for it like that's the you thing to go about it. so it's, far out of your way to do that playthrough yes like to the point of like you hit a point where it's very clearly not been fun for a long time and you're like suffering through just to see what would happen even though you're not having fun like they designed it <laughs> to deliberately not be fun after a certain point and you really gotta want it um and that's like again the whole point of like that you have to work really really hard to be a, a terrible person and then they're like why would you work this hard to make everyone suffer yeah and and i think the the piece that's um the the most interesting about that in specific honestly is um the fact that like i think you could in the beginning of the game accidentally stumble into doing it if you were a person who's like oh i can just fight monsters and they all give me experience I'm just going to stand here and fight a whole bunch of them. 
Yeah, yeah I'm right. going to grind like a lot of people do in other games. And if you do that long enough in the beginning, eventually a fight will start and the music will change uh, and there will only be a message with no monsters and it just says, but nobody came. Because you have killed every single monster in the area as far as the game is concerned, which is why people call it the genocide route. It's just like, yep, you left no bodies or, or no no living bodies. You just did what you had to do, and you can continue to do that through the whole game. Uh, that's that's how you get there. Uh, gonna be honest, I don't know that I super recommend playing the game that way unless you really, 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 really want to do them couple of unique boss fights like I did. Um, yeah, I mean it's yeah it's 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 designed explicitly not to be fun. <laughs> yeah, the game calls you a bad so. person the whole time because you are a bad person when you do that. And it also it also like deletes most of the content, like especially when yep. you get to like the later areas where there are supposed to be puzzles and dialogue and unique things to see. The game just removes all of them, so like you you really <laughs> the game another way the game punishes you is they're like well. You don't want to play the game, no game then. There's no characters, no silly nothing yeah, for you to see. Yeah, it's basically like, hey, this game wasn't built for you to optimize the fun out of it. Stop optimizing the fun out of it. Yeah, And actually, right. I'm going so, to take away content from you for doing this while also technically locking other content behind it. It's all, it's all a very uniquely, intentionally constructed way of, like for me, going to be honest, had there not been the promise of unique boss fights behind doing that, I probably wouldn't have done it. Because, like you said, most of the rest of that playthrough, not super fun uh, to do it that way. Um, and the game also has a whole lot of commentary on that. Um, I, I actually, I would love, I can't find it right now. I would, I'd have to take a little bit of time. There is a um, completely other game. Uh, in Dark Souls 3, one of the DLCs, there is a character that basically comments on, uh, I, the beginning of it is, it's Sir Wilhelm from Dark Souls 3 for anyone else who is a Dark Souls fan. Uh, he, he starts up with like, I've seen your kind time and time again, no stone left unturned, blah, blah, blah. Like it's basically him not looking at whatever, uh, the, your, um, your character is in the game. I almost called them Tarnish. That's not what they are in Dark Souls. That's the Elden Ring one. <laughs> um, uh, the Ashen one. He's not looking at the Ashen one. He's basically looking right into the camera at the player and saying, Yes, I know exactly who and what you are and that you're going to go and attempt to do every single thing and scrape it no matter what the cost because that's who and what you are. That's what you do. It's what you want. Um, and that's basically what the whole genocide playthrough is screaming at you the whole time. It's just like, listen, we both know what this is. We both know what you're trying to do. Stop. Don't. You don't have to do this. You're actively electing to do a terrible thing because you're like, but what if there's more content? As someone who on this podcast has said, I will go out of my way to try and get like to see everything in a video game if I really like it, which is exactly why I did that. But the game, but Toby Fox knows that's why he wanted to say that. He goes, that's not, that's not what this is supposed to be. You can do that here, but it's not what it's supposed to be. That's not what I wanted people to get out of this. Which is hilarious because. In in so doing that, he's made one of the like the the genocide route is like one of the most unique pieces of content of like any game ever. And it's like one of the things that people know about this game and has made it legendary, <laughs> like ironically. Yeah, it's like and on some level, I think that was intentional, you know? Yeah, it, it's it's very I don't know. It's very cool. Everyone wants to see it. I think. If you're going to play this game, you should do the pacifist route, and then you should maybe watch the genocide route if you're interested in that. And I think what's really interesting about the genocide route, too, that I didn't realize until you get to the very end is um, there is more that you learn about the story that is only accessible in the genocide route about some of the characters and some of their actions that I was like, oh, yep. I didn't realize he would put some of the most like interesting and obscure stuff about the story this late into this playthrough, yeah. which is why I'm going to be honest. So we've talked enough about the spoilers. I don't know if I want to talk about that stuff in specific. I don't think that's necessarily like you should still go experience what all of those things are for yourself, in my opinion, even if it's to watch somebody else play it, because in context, it's going to be a lot better than listening to us two jokers. Just say it into a microphone at you. 
Um, I've already said more than enough, I think, in terms of spoilers. Um, I hope what we've said so far is basically just enough um, to get you to be like, oh, okay, okay, I get it. I, I think I'm interested enough to want to see where this is going to go and what that would do if you've never played it before. So please do that if you if you have. We'll probably talk about some story beats, but I don't know that I necessarily want to talk about that particular piece. That's all, you know? Yeah, yeah, That I mean... That's all you really need to say is that there is there is some important stuff about the characters and about some of the events as they have played out that you won't know unless you've seen the end of the genocide route, which is cool. Yep. Yep. Um, man, see, this is what I'm talking about. Even in these early, you get to these early stages and it's like every single screen and every encounter is like a unique experience with a unique character and a unique joke like... Yeah, I'm going to, you know, we haven't talked about like, like, I know I said like quirky and stuff early on. Um, and I know it's very generic to just be like, I think the writing is really good in this game. I think because almost all of the, like the writing and what is happening overall, I think is very interesting and unique, but all the dialogue and the jokes and everything are all very clever and quick witted in my opinion. Like every character in this game is, is either the butt end of a joke or has a funny thing to say <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, they're, they're all very well characterized. When somebody says or speaks a certain way, it's very obvious that it's that character in specific talking. Uh, not just because they go, hey, you know, uh, Sans, uh, our skeleton man, uh, all of his dialogue, uh, he has a different um, sound for his voice and all of his text is in Comic Sans specifically. And Papyrus is in the Papyrus font and blah, blah, blah. There's There's lots of... When X person is doing something, you know they're doing it. It is conveyed to you on like multiple levels to be sure that you are like, yes, this is this person. There's never any confusion about um, any of the characters or what their intentions are or what they care about. They're all very forthcoming and very um, uniquely characterized by it. Even like right now, I didn't know that if you kept ringing the, the thing for the dog. I probably have tried it, but... I forgot about it. He, he, there's just unique dialogue for hitting the the bell over and over again. Someone's been smoking dog treats. Is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Oh, you know, I'm going to, I doubt we're going to get there in the video. I'm going to throw out there. So I already mentioned uh, the setup to what I think is actually my favorite joke in the entire game. So there's the dummy in the beginning, and you talk to the dummy, and it says, you try talking to the dummy, and it says, it doesn't seem much for conversation with dot, dot, dot. In the middle of the game, there is a, a mad dummy fight, um, <laughs> yep. and you can attempt to talk to the mad dummy, and you get the exact same prompt response at first. It says, you try talking to the dummy. It doesn't seem much for the conversation, or it doesn't seem much for conversation, and then it pauses for a second, and there's an extra one, and it just says, no one is happy about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, then the dummy attacked you. It's really funny. <laughs> it's my favorite joke. There's there's so many good bits, but like that one really got me for some reason, and I don't know why. I wasn't expecting it. I'm like, what a great callback joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, every... Yeah. I mean... God. Do you have like a favorite character or like a favorite uh, scenario or or something? Ooh, it's it's pretty deep into the game. There is the last of what I'll call um, it's not with your character, but it's one of the dating mini games, and you have to answer one very specific question, Andy. I know what it is. I know what the question. Andy, is. what's the question? The question is: Is anime real? And obviously, you say <laughs> anime is real <laughs> because that's the correct answer. That's that's my favorite interaction in the game. So <laughs> I knew I knew it as soon as you said. So yeah, there's uh to to tiny spoilers for a little bit of characterization for a couple characters. I won't put their we're names past in everything. spoilers. We've already yeah, said yeah, but those. I'm trying not to reveal too much. No, we're just talk. We're now we're just two guys talking about Undertale and anyone who's listening two white is guys also on a, a guy podcast. Who <laughs> any, anyone else is another white guy on a podcast who who knows they've they know Undertale as well as we do, so we don't have to hide anything from them anymore. That's probably true. Yeah, but, but it the, is true. But these other people who are listening to us might not know. 
They're not. You we told know. them to leave. You don't know. We told them to go. Oh, that's true. I guess we did. That doesn't mean they listened, it, though. That's how if, it works. You, Just like this video game, Andy. They're like, don't kill the monsters. And you're like, but what if I did? I don't care. Then let them spoil it. No, I'm going to say it. <laughs> Undying and Alphys go on a date and they kiss. Yeah. That's not till later. Yeah. Yeah. I love that they have a date in the in the garbage dump. That's hilarious yeah. to me. I just think the fun it's funny that the pretense of why they don't know whether anime is real or not is because all the stuff so so the human world like exists above. Like the monsters are all trapped in the underground. So but but stuff from the human world falls into the garbage dump, including old comics and stuff, which everyone reads and they go, Oh my god, these history books are incredible. <laughs> I can't yeah, believe yeah. how amazing the human world is. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> Dude, I like, think they have giant my... robots and stuff. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Why don't we go up there? <laughs> this this is unrelated, but maybe my favorite gag, one of my favorite gags, is the the snail racing mini game where where he's like, <laughs> press A to make your snail yes. go faster, and so you start mashing A, and your snail starts slowing down and flips over and starts on fire. And he's like, oh, I guess the pressure got to him. Yep, he's like, oh, you encouraged him too much. You couldn't handle it. <laughs> Which is like, it's another one of those moments where like in any other RPG, it would just be press A as fast as you can and it'd be a little mini game. I don't instead. even know if it's possible for you to like tap A at the right rates, even just like occasionally. No. I don't think you can win that race. I think that's the only outcome is he either loses is, yeah. or that happens. <laughs> Which yes, is really is. funny. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh that's... no. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, just amazing. This game is this game is great. Yeah, it it's just filled with with cute little things like that. Um and uh just as so so you're you're trying to leave, I guess, and you find out that there is a there's a barrier between the human world and uh the underground and that it's going to take a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of doing uh to get that barrier broken so that you can leave. Um and that's later on in the story when it starts to finally get like real heavy and you start to learn more about like, well, how did we actually get here kind of thing? So is it is it time to talk about the point in the game that made me cry and then forward oh, yeah. to the end? Cause, cause it's talk talk about your goat boy. Yeah. So so you get most of the way into the game and you've uh befriended some some other monsters and you've potentially gone and done like individual like side quests where you like make friends with bosses you formerly fought and everything but you get to the end uh or towards the end because your goal has been to get to uh king asgore uh because he's the one who's basically guarding the barrier and um you're probably gonna have to fight him in order to to get through and eventually you find out that the only way uh for someone to cross through the barrier um is to basically merge a human soul and a monster soul. Uh, so you basically get told, hey, you're going to have to go fight King Asgore. And you don't know who King Asgore is. You've heard about him the whole game. They Everyone says he's tough. There's a couple people who are like, oh, he, he, he might be tough, but he's like a big old softy and blah, blah, blah. So you go through all this stuff, and then you go up um, a long elevator and, and everything, and you walk into what looks exactly like Toriel's house that we saw in the beginning uh, of the ruins and the song undertale starts to play and uniquely I think that guitar part I think is the only actual recorded thing that isn't just like a MIDI sound in the entire game so you hear it and you're like oh like an actual instrument is playing right now which is odd um and the melody of Undertale is the same thing as that dun, dun, dun that you hear right in the beginning and is throughout uh, all these points of the game. But, like, this is, in theory, like, the source of where that melody is supposed to come from. And so this song is playing, and it's beautiful, and every single time I hear it, it makes me cry. And you're walking through, and you get the, like, fight begin screen, but you don't actually get into a fight. Um, it's a bunch of monsters, and they begin to tell a story of a long time ago, uh, the king and the queen ruled, and they had uh, their son, and everyone was pretty happy, and a human fell into the underground. 
and they went and they helped the human and they basically took in the other human like as their own child. Um, and eventually they get to the point where, well, one day uh, the human got sick um, and they weren't really sure what to do. And everyone was sad and blah, blah, blah. And a couple things happened and they go, well, the next day the human died. And the whole underground is distraught. The king and the queen are, are distraught. And the, the prince, uh, their son, um, kind of loses it because that was, that was his best friend in the whole world. That was like everything to him. Uh, so the whole story you got before about how you need a monster soul and a human soul to cross the barrier is he takes the human soul and carries the body. And he turns into like this really powerful monster thing. I guess that's what happens when those things merge. And he carries the human's body to the human world because his request before he had died, or them, I guess, uh, it's nondescript, uh, was that they wanted to see the flowers from their village. And so he goes, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the flowers. And he walks out, and he's just this like, impossibly powerful monster. And naturally, he's walking into this flower field, and all the humans are looking around like, oh, my God, what is this thing? And they just start attacking him. And he manages to basically just walk through a bunch of their attacks and get to the flower field, but then tries to come back um, to um, the monster world in the underground and just collapses and dies as well. And falls, and, and from where he falls and dies, a single flower um, blooms because of the seeds getting stuck to his, uh, his monster fur. Um, so... You go through all this, and the, basically at the end of everything, and this song is playing, it's going through multiple movements and blah, blah, blah. It's great. Uh, they're like, hey, uh, King Asgore is going to save us all. King Asgore will free us. Um, and I think the last lines... Oh, oh no. I'm getting choked up thinking about it. The last lines from the whole thing are, you should be smiling too. Aren't you excited? Aren't you happy? You're going to be free with the expectation that Asgore is supposed to take your soul uh, to be the last of seven souls that they need to have enough power to destroy the barrier. So you go and you go through this whole thing and then you walk into the throne room and you see a, a, dude, a big dude in like a cape and he's got like a helmet on and everything. He's turned around and he's just messing with some flowers in the garden and he turns around and he looks just like Toriel. And you go, uh-oh. Oh, no. And he's not aggressive. And he just goes, he, he turns around, and the song that plays there, it's just a couple notes, is just called Small Shock. He turns around, and he literally just reels back and is like, oh. Hi. Nice day today, isn't it? Good day for a game catch. Um, okay, um, I guess when you're ready, I'll be in the next room. He does not want to fight you, <laughs> same as Toriel. Uh, and then you have to go through, I've been talking a lot, so I'm going to let you pick up uh, at a certain point. But, but yeah, there's just this whole thing, this emotional moment, and this king who also does not want to fight you at all. But he goes, this is what we have to do. This is the only way... Like, this is what I've been doing all this time. We have the other souls. Either I beat you, and I get the soul that I need uh, to free us, or you beat me, and you get to go home. Uh, so you go, and you stand in front of the barrier, and you talk to him again. Uh, and he, I think he literally says, um, if you have anything else to do, if you're not ready, that's okay. Neither am I. Yeah, so, I don't know. The game just really layers on the, like, nobody wants to do this. Everything about this is terrible. We shouldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think your first time through, it's, like, a very... It's a bit of a confusing moment because you don't expect Toriel's house to be Asgore's house, and you don't expect him to not want to fight you in the way that he does. Um, But it's... I don't know, it's all touching and it all sort of speaks to the entire message which is of this game, which is that like violence sucks. And like even even in the moments where like um 
the enemies like realize that they have to be violent to you. Like they don't want to do it, which again, it just, it speaks to like the soul of this game, which is like, don't be messed up and don't hurt people if you don't have to. Yeah. And then Flowey shows up and ruins everything, <laughs> regardless of, of how that fight goes. So the other major thing with uh, the Asgore fight is you get a really unique intro to that where it plays a little song and it kind of gives you like a, uh, this boop, is the end of boop, your journey. Boop, yes. Very, very good. Boop, boop, um, boop, 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 but Berg, it's it's boop, something in German. Boop, boop, Can't remember what that is. Birkentrucken or something boop, like that. I don't know what the boop, actual word is. Boop, boop, the sync isn't going to work out for this. It's going to sound terrible online. You're welcome, everybody. Oh, sorry. Yeah, anyway, more of incredible music. <laughs> um, but the last thing before the fight actually starts is he goes, okay, and then he has a unique animation, and his weapon's a big trident, and he throws it through the mercy button and destroys it. Oh, and that's when you're like, oh, that's, no. So that's the moment you go, oh, no. I really do have to fight him because I can't spare him. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. it's the first time in the game that you are actively forced to do a fight against anyone. Um, and yeah, there's there's a couple different ways that that plays out at the end. Basically, when you succeed, he's like, "Okay, take my soul." You did it. You earned it. This is what you came here to do. And you have the chance to spare him at that moment as well. Um, and if you do that, he's like, I can't believe you would come this far and then just say that actually you'd rather stay. And then he goes, oh, well, you can stay here and me and my wife will be able to take care of you and blah, blah, blah. And then Flowey just murders him. <laughs> wait, wait. Question. If you if you kill him anyway, F Flowey still shows up? He shows up and... Uh, the so the animation of what happens is uh you know like either Flowey does it or you do it and then like the 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 boss soul shows up and it kind of lingers for a second and then Flowey shoots it from the outside because he uh, goes oh you don't have that uh and then takes over everything and so Flowey shows up and he absorbs the other human souls because he goes hey actually this was all my plan to get you to clear the path for me to get here and so that I could do this so. Good job, dummy. And as it turns out, Flowey knows about the save thing because he used to be able to do that. The reason oh he God. the reason he knows is because he's like, I have done everything there is to do. I have killed everyone. I have saved everyone. And I just reload my save for the end of it. It doesn't matter. I just, I'm bored. I don't know. I don't feel anything. So this is what I have to do in order to entertain myself. I don't have- He doesn't say that yet. Uh, I think he says he doesn't feel anything at this point. Yeah, but you don't know about his whole sk save scum powers yet. Uh, I mean, he explains it to you like as this fight is beginning because he uses it during the fight, which is the coolest part. So you get to do a really unique fight that is no longer just this like menu turn based thing, but you're still moving around. But yeah, like in the middle of the fight, you'll see in the bottom left corner, it'll be like save slot one saved or whatever it is. And he'll yeah. load the saves in the middle of the fight. To like teleport you back to the spot when he originally saved that will put you back in harm's way. It's really, really special. It is basically the the most unique way of like having a time manipulation guy uh, fight you. It's real good. I think it's super cool. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's just like so. I think the first time it happens, like I feel like now. I hate to I hate to be like th this like negative, but I feel like there's a perspective of it now that you're like oh. That's a really easy like trick of a, of the code to like eliminate the save file and make it look like but like if you play this on PC the first time and it like genuinely uh deletes your save file and there are points where if you lose it crashes the window entirely I was, on I was your just going to say I don't actually remember how it works on console cuz I did also play this on Switch some years ago but yes when you do this fight so the fr when when he initially absorbs the souls the game crashes and that's intentional and you reboot the yeah. game and it's like Flowey's world is what the save is or something like that. He's just like, yep, I took over. Here we are. And if you lose, the game crashes because he just laughs at you and closes the game because he's just taunting you. And it, it just like, 
it's such a i feel like it's got to be like it maybe not that simple a trick of the code but like it's so easy to see that that's just like a theatrical trick of the game it works but it's so the, well it's so yeah. effective <laughs> oh the first time it like, happens it's, yeah because you're like why'd the game crash right now and then and then you yeah. boot it back up you go oh oh okay they got me they got me really good <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so unsettling to see, especially after years and years of playing video games, to just see, like, your save file is gone. Like, and he just tells you, your save file is gone. That Like, this this is like your waking hell right now, and there's no escape from it. Like, but because of the save file trick, you feel that. You're like, oh my god, I can't, I can't reload. What am I gonna do? It's, oh, I'm it's actually, really, like... Yeah, I'm pretty sure that if you look in the save file folder like where the file would be it is actually gone for that moment <laughs> if i'm not Amazing. mistaken um there's there's other flags and stuff about like you know why everything you know changes as you as you go through the fight and everything but but yeah it's it's all these like all the meta layers like at this particular point have been for the most part peeled back and it's just looking at you right in the eye going hey the 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 game has rejected you as a player like that power that you had before it is taken away from you and it doesn't want to give it back. Uh, and it's great. It's really cool. And again, that's why I'd say like, it's a thing. This only works as a video game. You can't, the, the fact that you have agency and the ability to do that and to make that decision for yourself to be like, Oh, I'm going to save scum or I'm not going to save scum. You cannot do that in any other medium. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and the, the, the Photoshop flowy fight is just so horrifying the first time you see it yes. and, and like the whole especially... game is pixel and then this thing happens and comes out you're like oh it's a different art style entirely it it is yeah, truly it... from another world basically <laughs> Yeah, it, it just totally bends your mind the first time you see it. You just can't you're like, I can't believe that's what I'm looking at in this in this game. It's just like insane beyond insanity and like that expectation break. It's again, it's like the Undertale moment. It's like at the beginning when Toriel uh you kill Toriel and then you, you save scum. Just there's all these moments where like they stick with you forever because Undertale has pulled this phenomenal, amazing trick on you. And you're like, I can't even believe what I'm seeing right now. Yeah. And, and I think there's, you know, a lot of this, like fundamentally it is hinging on a bunch of fourth wall breaking type of things of like looking directly at the audience and saying, I'm talking to you instead. Right. And there's a lot of stuff that does fourth wall breaking that I think is not very clever or doesn't really do anything unique with a fourth wall break. Um, and it just is like a joke that happens for a brief moment. And it's really, I don't know, I think there's a fine line to ride with whether or not that's clever or whether or not that's contrived and stupid. And Undertale has, to me, one of the most clever implementations of that that I've ever seen. It's really good. <laughs> Yeah, because instead of just pointing at the audience and like winking and saying like, "Isn't that funny?" Yeah, ho, ho, it's you're like, playing a video game. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> right, like it's it's using the the knowledge that you're a player and the the knowledge that you've built up as someone who's played video games many times to like to to like explicitly play with your emotions. So like it's it's not doing the generic wink at you thing like ha ha ha. It's it's using it in explicit ways to like comment on you as the player. Yeah. It has things to say about you as the player and the choices that you're making rather than just, Oh, I know you're doing it. Did you know that yeah. I knew you were doing it? You know, right. That if it was that surface level, this game, honestly, it wouldn't be on my radar at all. It would have been a fun, cute first romp, but the fact it does that thing effectively is what elevates it to a completely other level, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and look, it's a snow puff. It's a snow puff. And this and this is a snow puff. Is a snow puff. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? A, it's a snow puff. A snow puff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's I think the the moral of of this story and this game and, and really all of it can be summed up with um I think there truly is no other game I've played anything even remotely a little bit like Undertale. Like, not only is it unique, but it's it, it's so unique in every moment from anything else I've ever played in my whole life, which is why it's continued to 
be one that I put above the rest. That and like just everything about it is lovable and hilarious and amazing. Yeah, man. Um, I I completely agree on every front. It's um it's it's very special to me for a number of reasons, and that's why I'm talking about it on the internet with you right now. Because if if somehow you haven't experienced this, you really you just should. I really just think yeah. you should. I I think it says a lot. Like when I sat down to play this game for the podcast a couple couple weekends ago, it was like I think it was like Saturday night or something or, or Friday night, and I was like, "Cool, I'm gonna go to my giant bean bag." I don't know if you're aware that I have a giant bean bag. Oh, I've been uh, thinking about getting something like that for a long time. Here's the thing: oh, I have a be, new one. I never told oh, you. Here's the thing: that'd be really great in this room in specific, actually. So yep. I'm gonna have to think about that. I, I I've talked so, about that idea for a while. So before and before I forget, this door they're about to come up to, we have to talk about afterwards because I don't know anything about this door. Um, oh really? But yes. Well, I think I might have at one point. But um, so but the couple weekends ago, like Saturday night, I was like, I'm gonna grab my switch and I'm gonna go hang out on my bean bag alone and turn the lights off and start up Undertale. And like the fact that I've played this game through. 10 plus times and seen it beginning to the end that many times. And I just sat down and I was just like, ah, like I feel like I'm coming home playing this game. There's just such a, like a sense of comfort, even though I've seen basically all there is to see because the world is so comforting and, and so gripping like that, that to me says everything about this game. Like I couldn't believe I was still so in love with it, it <laughs> so many years later. Yeah, I, I, I super agree on that too. It, it it's weird. Be, the, the comfort thing I think is uh, the perfect term for it because uh, for me, um, despite not being, you know, like I had those couple of, Oh, I didn't even know I could do things that way. There was no point in this game where undertale was continuing to surprise me. Right. But that's because I've kind of squeezed all the surprise out of the game, which is also a thing that, like, it's commenting on people doing in a lot of ways. Like, the game's been out for almost 10 years. I've played it to death. I've experienced it in about every way that you reasonably can. You know, I didn't do... There's, there's in theory, a whole bunch of what they call, like, neutral ending routes that can all be different depending on who's around and who's alive and what you did and blah, blah, blah. And there's, like, there's a huge number of different permutations of dialogue and stuff that you'll get out of that uh, that is based on like the world state when you do that end encounter um i don't want to say everything that's going to happen um it, no i lied i do want to talk about one thing with the true pacifist route because uh the second really 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 emotional part of the game for me is after so there there is an extra section of the game if you if you go through and you kill no one even that Asgore fight doesn't really count. Um, when you load the game another time, you'll actually get a phone call and says, hey, you should go talk to to this person. And you get a new little side quest and that whole dating thing we were Office. talking about happened earlier. But then you go down and you find out a whole lot more about what is actually going on, about how we got here. Uh, and you go down to a the really yeah, a really nightmarish lab that it calls the True Lab that is in the basement of uh, Dr. Alphys's lab. And you find out that um, Dr. Alphys was doing experimentation on um, a bunch of different monsters uh, because they were trying to figure out a way to break the barrier with the power of determination. Because determination is the thing that they say is unique to human souls. And the thing with the most determination in the underground is what gets the power to save which is why you get the power to save when you show up. Because you show up, and Flowey can't do it anymore. And you're like, that's weird. Why would Flowey be able to do that? Uh, and as you find out, um, Flowey is the flower that um, the, the king and queen's son died on that Alphys then took to the lab and injected with determination from the human souls that they had gathered. And then they wake up one day, and, and, and she just goes, uh-oh, flower's gone. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> uh, so I have a qu I have a question as this is dawning on me. Mm -hmm. So um Flowey is Oh hey, it's Glide. Oh yeah, it's the about... unique Glide fight. I've I've seen this but I've I don't know how to get I it. I think I actually did this um last playthrough. I think you just need to to be in a specific area um to have him do it. You like sit and wait around in the Oh yeah, you, you sit you sit in that area for like a few minutes or whatever it is, and then you run and eventually he just shows up. 
Nice. Yeah. Okay, so here's here's my question. So the first human that um dies that is um Azriel's friend. That's that's the first human? Yes. Is Frisk? Uh no, so Frisk All right, other, other spoilers. You're fr- you're Frisk. Yeah, I'm so sorry. It, yeah, right, in right, the right. in the very beginning of the game, like at the title screen, it says name the fallen human is the prompt that you're given. And what you find out later on is that the name that you give that character is actually the name of the very first human who fell. There are six human souls, which means six humans showed up before you did. And you find out that actually the character you've been playing as is named Frisk. And they are their own person and that they are unique. Um, And that's another one of those commentaries on like, hey, who and what are you sort of thing. And we talked about the genocide route and stuff before. I'm just like, hey, um, the first human actually wasn't really that great of a person. Uh, and the joke is they expect you to name the fallen human after yourself. So it's like looking at you right in the eye and going, why would you do this? <laughs> Here, Okay, so here's my question for you then. If he's the first human and like Flowey seems surprised that you've stolen the ability to save from him, but you're the seventh human, how, how is that not happened with the other six humans and how is the timeline still intact if he has reset it so many times Uh, that's kind of weird isn't it uh because so when they show up and they do that they still all end up losing at some point in their journey and dying right um and i think at a certain point they all kind of they lose the determination and they give up which is why they have the six human souls I, i i think that's the implication there's also something um, potentially unique about, I don't know if it is that um, the soul that Frisk has is implied to be like the same soul as the first human or something like that. I can't remember. It's Here's the thing. To me, it's really not all that important. That's the like, I'm learning, yeah, to, I'm, right. I'm learning too much about the game and care too much about the specific lore and I have to, everything has to be explained. Everything has to be connected, Andy. Everything has to be the MCU. You know, like I, I and, it just, and the it game just goes, like occurred to me that I was like, oh, if it, if he was the first human, and Flowey's been around for the six humans in between, there's like so much, there's like so much implied there that I had never thought about until this moment. Especially because Flowey talks about, yep, I have done everything there is to do. Trust me, if you can think about it, I've tried it, which implies that he's basically like been doing it for effectively like almost eternity as close to eternity as is reasonable for him to just be like, yep. And we're just back here again. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's rather interesting. Uh, and there's a lot of layers to, to all of that. Um, and yeah, the, the specifics end up really not being important. Uh, it's just really about like kind of what is the implication of what the character's intentions are. Um, so yeah, I guess to, to loop all the way back around. Um, so flowey being that flower, uh, turns out, um, for whatever reason, injecting determination into that flower made it so that um, Asriel was the flower now, but didn't have a soul, which meant that he couldn't feel anything at all. No emotions, no happiness, no sadness, no nothing. So none of the terrible things he did ever mattered to him at some point because it was just a way to pass the time. That's Kind of like you when you kill monsters in an RPG. Yep. Yeah, and that's that's all that's all there was to it. So so the whole um true pacifist ending basically is Flowey shows up and uh tricks everyone into they basically say the power of one human soul is the equivalent of every other human soul, basically. Uh or, or sorry, every monster soul in the underground would need to be put together to make the power of one human soul, which is why it's so easy for you to kill monsters because uh you need killing intent in order to do that kind of stuff. It's all kind of silly little lore stuff. But he basically tricks everyone into showing up in in your all the warriors moment at the end where he's like, ah, what are you guys all doing? How could this happen? And they're all trying to save you from him. And he goes, you dumb idiots. Why would you all come here at the same time? I'm just going to take all your souls and the human souls. And so he does that and he turns back into Asriel like as little goat boy again, except he's got the God power thing that he had before. Actually, it's even stronger. And so you do that whole fights and there's a lot of uh, very emotional things that happen during that where eventually you get him to realize that what he's doing is stupid and a waste of time. And he's literally sitting and telling you the fight. 
I don't really care about any of this. Uh, and eventually you keep doing it and he goes, I just, I just kept doing this because I wanted, I just wanted to keep playing with you because it's the only thing I've ever been able to do. And he eventually realized it's wrong and gives up the powers and breaks the barrier. And before he kind of fades back into a flower, you have a moment where he's like, I've done a lot of really terrible stuff. Could you ever forgive me? And you have the option to, it's like forgive and do not. Um, and to me, I cannot imagine <laughs> getting, yeah, who, getting who to this Earth point, got this part? getting to the point in this game and just completely missing the lesson of just like, you know what? Yes. Even, even this guy couldn't be saved, you know? Um, yeah. and so you forgive him and he goes, I'm going to turn back into a flower soon. Um, but you know, take care of mom and dad for me. And I think the most powerful little animation I can think of in an entire video game can potentially happen next because you then get the chance because he's really sad that he's about to turn back into a flower because he knows he's not going to have feelings again anymore. And so he's upset and you get the chance. It says uh, comfort him or do not. And if you pick comfort him, uh, the little tiny... If you've been watching the video, you see how simple the sprite animations are. They're very, very simplistic. Friss walks up to this little goat child, and in a few steps, you see a couple arms go out low for a hug, and then you see Asriel's arm go around Friss's back, and then Friss starts to just give him little back rubs as, like, comfort, and it is... <laughs> While the music's playing, oh, I'm getting upset again. Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's dude. It oh is my heart god! Oh my, oh, oh my god. god! It's so, it's, it's really good. I'm like, why, why is this massive, like, like 400 total pixels in the middle of the screen making me like, like cry? <laughs> I'm weep, so, yeah, weep. yeah. I'm, I'm like bawling. Like, oh man. Um, yeah. And then after that, um. So there's a really cool part that happens because like everyone comes back and the barrier's broken and they're like, oh my God, the barrier's broken. That means we can go to the human world. And at that point, you actually can, instead of walking up to the surface and then going through the last couple ending sequences, you can walk back through the whole game everywhere as like a victory lap and all the NP basically every NPC who's not in that last room who's going to be on the surface with you in the end is back somewhere in the world and has unique dialogue about, hey, I can't believe you did all this and that we can go to the human world now. It's yeah. it's one of the coolest game finale things because if you don't care about that, you don't have to do that. But if you really, really want to see what everyone has to say about everything that's happened, there's a whole section at the end of the game completely optional after all the you going through all that trouble to go through this unique specific ending you have to do a bunch of specific things for uh yeah it's it's real good it's really 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 good and you can walk all the way back to the very 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 first room where you fall down um and you see Azrael uh still he hasn't turned into a flower yet at the flower bed that you fall into and you can talk to him a whole bunch and he has a whole bunch more things to say and eventually uh you can Basically, you know, run out his dialogue like you can with anyone in any video game. Do you know what he says when you do that? Yeah, I've uh, I've seen it, but it's it's been a long time. I don't remember. He literally just goes, "Oh, Frisk, don't you have anything better to do?" Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then he'll just repeat that over and over again if you keep talking to him. So that's like the okay, you have you've done everything. You should get on out of here. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it's really wonderful. And then the the credit sequence and everything happens, and blah blah blah, which is also very good. Uh, the one thing, so now that I'm thinking about, it, I I have not booted the game since actually doing this. But when you boot the game for the first time after doing this complete run and seeing the credits and everything, um, you boot it and it cold opens into Flowey just kind of showing up for a second, and he's like, "Hey, everyone's happy." Yeah, right. Um, Maybe you should leave things the way they are and, and, the, and not yeah. ruin this reality that you've worked so hard yeah, to make. Yeah, don't, like, you in theory could delete your save and reset and everything, but, like, do you really have to? 
And so the game literally looks you in the eye and goes, you don't have to replay this. You, that yeah, was, you, don't have you, to, you got the experience that I wanted you to have if you got here. You're done now. You don't have to do this. We, we know what you're thinking, and don't, don't do it. Yeah. Um, don't go back and murder everyone just for fun. Yeah. So it, the game does, it, it grabs you by the shirt and pulls you towards the screen and says, don't. Don't. Just don't. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, and obviously you can. You and then the other unique thing is, so through, as, as you play the game, if you play in multiple sessions, on the title screen, as you meet more of the monsters, they kind of just show up and they're on the title screen in a little pose or something like Toriel sitting in a chair reading and blah, blah, blah. Um, but when you come back after that, no one is there because they're all on the surface <laughs> living their lives. Oh, I didn't even put that together. Yeah. I've seen that screen many times because I've reset this game and not taken Flowey's advice. Uh, but I, <laughs> And I know there's no one there, but I didn't realize that was like uh, an explicit part of it. Yeah, because when you do it initially, there's no like chair or any of the placement. You can see like the remainders of like a handful of things that people had been doing, but none of the characters are there. They're just all gone. So, yeah, it's, hmm. yeah, like I said, on, on pretty much every level, the game is like, yep. I know what you're thinking and what you will try and take away from this and what is implied by this action and yada, yada, yada. And it just, again, it has no problems being like, I know what you're going to do. Please just, you don't have to. You just don't have be to. cool, bro. Yeah, just, just be cool. Yeah, we're better than this. We don't have to do this. You don't have to squeeze every ounce of enjoyment out of everything all the time. That's not necessarily the way things are supposed to work. And boy, howdy, 10 years later... <laughs> <laughs> do yeah. I as someone who does like to enjoy a lot of things to the fullest like I really as someone who on this podcast talked about his many hundreds of hours in Elden Ring you know like I, <laughs> you yeah. still you don't yep. have to do these things I promise you don't yeah well okay so to to sort of take an aside and go a different route I remembered the thing that came across me this playthrough that I was like oh I never not that I had never seen it, but I had never put two and two together, and it, it dawned on me as a new uh, discovery. Would you like to know what it is? What is it? It's when you talk to the, the turtle shop, who's like about halfway through the game in uh, Waterfall. He has he has a bunch of dialogue, the merchant. Um, and one of the things is you can ask him about the symbol that's that's got like the little fairy, like the shield symbol that's on Toriel's shirt or whatever. Oh, Oh, I didn't know you didn't know this. Yeah. Do you, well, I because I haven't played it. Yeah. I haven't played this game in a long time. Mm -hmm. But he tells you that that's called the Delta Rune. Yep. And you're like, oh, yep. that has implications for my future. Yeah. So, <laughs> so separate from everything, um, there is now you can go on on Steam right now, um, and there is Toby Fox's next game, uh, the first two chapters of which you can play for free currently, and it is a game called Delta Rune. Um, and Delta and it's like as long as as Undertale currently. Oh yeah. Um, so Delta Rune, uh, if you haven't already put it together, is an anagram of Undertale. But also, Delta Rune was apparently the game that he had originally had in his head like a long time ago. Um, and eventually, it was like, ah, that I don't know if I know how to do that. It seems kind of complicated. We talk about man who made one of the most unique video games of all time. <laughs> yeah i mean jesus and then the kickstarter thing happened he was like i'm gonna do this undertale thing but there's still obviously like he had rattled around this delta rune thing and so the the symbol yes of toriel and everything is referred to as the delta rune and that iconography i think also shows up in delta rune yeah as far does. as i'm aware the undertale world and delta rune are not in any way actually connected other than through in 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 kind of like the anthology way they're connected of like Oh, that person who looks like this, like every Final Fantasy game has chocobos. Does that mean they're all in the same world? No. I think it's one of those. But then again, oh, it's also it's also not done. So who knows? <laughs> no, I, I thought I he think... stated something about like, yeah, it's not supposed to be like an Undertale sequel or anything like that. It's it's not a sequel, but I think it's set in the same universe. I don't I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I'm not positive on that, but I. Th I think the implication right now is that it's not. But who knows? I could be. Wrong I'm about positive. That. 
I'm positive. One of the characters is named Ralse, which is also an anagram for Azriel. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I think this is what I think. There's a dude named Sid some... in like every Final Fantasy as well, but they're not the same dude. Yeah, well, they're not <laughs> as smart as Toby Fox. He's a dumb dog. He uh, is a dumb dog. <laughs> he is a stupid dumb dog. Um, an annoying the, dog, actually. This is this is what I think. Um, because there there is like a unique little. I don't know if it's like a side quest or stuff that you can discover, but like there is some stuff that you can discover in Sans's lab and also in some things that Sans does um, that implies that he knows about the timeline hopping and has done some experimentation to like learn about the timeline hopping. And I think that Deltarune is going to be set in the same Undertale universe, not not directly in a sequel way, but I think like... We it was implied in Undertale that Sans and Flowey knew about the greater universe and about like the intricacies of what the universe like might entail. So mm-hmm. I think it is going to be related in some adjacent timeline, greater way that we probably don't know yet. Yeah, it's possible. But here's the thing: also, oh, if it's it... not just possible; it's probable. I mean, yeah, but Mario. At, the, at the same time, if it's not like I don't. I don't need anything to be connected to Undertale. I think Undertale as a standalone piece of media is perfect as it is. And if there's never anything ever connected to it ever again, that's totally fine, you know? Um, I don't care at all about your needs. I'm just trying to <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to convey what Delta Rune is gonna be, how it's gonna be related to Undertale, because I th- I think it will be. And I think it, it, even in the way that like it breaks your expectations, like the first thing you do in Delta Rune is it's like choose your character, choose your personality, choose your appearance, and after you do all of that, it says to you like your choices don't matter in this world. So like they there's like a again that's related to Undertale because in Undertale all of your choices do matter. And so they kind of do that setup and then they break that expectation. So I think I, I think it's I think you know I think it's. It's gonna be, yeah. I don't know. We're, we're gonna, gonna be... we're gonna see. I, as as someone who, when chapter one basically just shadow dropped out of nowhere, he was like, "Yo, I'm making a game. You can play chapter one right now on Steam, right now." <laughs> um, and I I played some of it, and then I was like, "I think I want to play this in its entirety." And then it took a couple years for chapter two to drop, but I haven't gone back to it since. And that was like, oh no. I think that was in the before times. I think that was before the world ended in 2020. I think it was Pre-ronies. like yeah, I think it was like late 2019 that happened. I don't remember exactly, but something like that. Yeah, it was it was some years after Undertale um that he just like, "Hey, I got another game I'm working on. Here's some of it." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was pre Ronies, I think. No, no. The, well, chapter one was pre Ronies. Chapter two was not. Ch- chapter two was definitely sometime during the pandemic. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man. I mean, should we wrap up our talk on Undertale? Yeah, man. Um, I don't. I'll just reiterate how good the music is again. Um, I don't even know. We we talked how many we have been live for over an hour and a half. So I think we we said a bunch. I think we mostly just said our personal feelings on Undertale because I'm not going to pretend like I have something unique or new to say about a game that people have made many a video essay and many a fan game about for almost a decade now. (laughs) Uh, I don't think I have anything profound or or new to say. Just, um, man, if you somehow haven't experienced this game, you really should because... I had something profound to say about it. Did you hear my butt story? That's true. No one else has that. Well, maybe not no one. Maybe one other person has that <laughs> exact story. One. Like, like not a lot, just but like one, you know? What if that's the top comment on this YouTube video? I it's also like, had oh. tailbone surgery and couldn't do anything else and didn't know if I liked video games anymore or not. <laughs> I also cried when I hugged the goat boy. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Oh. There's a lot of crying. A lot of crying yeah. going on. Yeah, it's... It's a it's a good cutscene. Yeah, it's really a lot of yeah. emotions. I don't know, man. Undertale. It's um it's it's truly a unique, remarkable experience. Even if you heard everything that I said where I spoiled the crap out of a whole bunch of really good moments that I think would have been better if you hadn't heard them. 
you should go experience them because it's going to be different to actually do it. Having the controller in your hand and playing this game and being a part of it is so integral to the experience that I don't, that part I don't think can truly be spoiled. You can't know what that is until you do it. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it all, like, even just the simple moments of like, after Snowden, when you're like going through that that little cave section where it has all the crazy bell music and like those moments where you're just walking through this really simple but beautiful world, like listening to the music, there's there's just a vibe that parts of this game have that are like nothing else that are they're just worth experiencing once or ten times. You just you get sucked in by by just the entire vibe of this game, or at least I do. Yeah, man. Um, it. There's one of my favorite songs in recent memory is an incredible lo-fi cover of um, It's Raining Somewhere Else. It's it's like the best vibes of anything in like the whole world. Because that song is already one of those very minimal piano-driven things. And yeah, it's it's very good. Remember when I was texting you about that specific song? I was like, that song happens in a completely different part of the game than I thought it did. For some uh, reason. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Wh- which song are you talking about? It's Raining Somewhere Else. It's, yeah, which I don't know which one that one is. Um, it's, it's the one that plays when uh, Sands is like, hey, you want to go? So not in Grillby's for the, the lunch date, but when he does like the dinner thing at the hotel near the ends. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and it's apparently just just that point is where that song is. For some reason, I thought it was like in the in the cave waterfall section earlier because mm. it seems like it would make sense there. I'm like, oh, I just totally misremembered. But yeah. Yeah. Vibes are impeccable on yeah, every level this entire game. It's great. Go play it. Go play we're, it. And... And we'll we're gonna we'll, buy we're it gonna for talk friends. more next time about video games. I don't know which one's next, but yeah, I don't know. We gotta. I guess we gotta figure that out. There's a lot of video games out there, you know. Yeah. So. Um. This one was definitely a long time coming for the two of us, though, because like like we said, we both have a lot of history and a lot of history together with with this game in particular. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just when you said it, I was like, dude, I will always talk about Undertale at any time. Yeah, <laughs> on, and honestly, just on a personal note, so uh, you know, many people struggle with mental health, as do I. Um, Tommy here has changed up his medicine a few times, and he's realized that it made him uh, feel emotions differently than he has in some number of years. Uh, so I went, hmm, what if I, what if I start doing all those things that kind of like plucked at my emotional strings before to see how I feel about it now. Uh, with you know more perspective and blah 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 so it all just kind of like for me made sense of like it was a good time in my life to revisit this game as well um and i'm really glad i did because this game is special and unique and i don't really know like delta is gonna be a cool thing on its own it's gonna be very toby fox coded and blah 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 but like i have a feeling it's still gonna be something just distinctly different from what undertale is uh, and that's a yeah. good thing. And I think yeah. the Undertale will kind of stand almost alone as this this kind of this silly little monolith of a game. <laughs> if that yeah. makes any sense to say at all. Yeah, it, it it does. It's it stands completely on its own just as a piece of media and a piece of art. Um that that like no matter what comes before or after it, it's just it's it's Undertale, you know? Yeah. And you've only seen uh, on screen, if you've been paying attention visually the whole time, there's actually plenty more game way past this point. So if you're like worried about, oh, I've seen like a couple hours of it. It's not that long of a game. Tommy, uh, we kicked everyone out of the stream like an hour ago for no, spoilers. No, I'm still trying to convince people to play it. That's not the, They've I'm, all I'm, played I'm it. Not, everyone oh. listening has played it. That's true. Probably. Everyone, if you've played it, leave a comment. And if you haven't played it, also leave a comment and tell us. Every Everyone... Who's heard it has played it. Everyone who's in it is out of it, has played it, has not played it. The Alpha and the Omega. Sans has a unique boss fight. There, I said it. Whoa. You know what's really All funny? Right? In the soundtrack, if you just scroll through the soundtrack songs, there is a song that is called. I want to get the phrasing on it correct. Because I'm going to mess it up. 
Where is it? It's like the one true hero. Is that the one you're talking no, about? No, it's like literally like called like the song that plays when you fight Sans. Which, <laughs> which is not anywhere in the game at all. Uh, yes, yeah, I know that song actually. Yeah, I've heard it. <laughs> because when you go through the like it, and, and that's that's a fun little meta joke of just like if you were to scroll through the soundtrack list and be like, oh, I'm gonna have to fight Sans at some point. And then you go through the whole game and you neither do that unless you do a very, very, very specific set of things. And then you still don't hear that song. And then <laughs> you neither do the fight or hear the song. You're like, what's happening? Why did this yeah. what did I miss? And the answer is you you didn't. You got tricked because that's what Toby wanted to do. Really Amazing. good. <laughs> Go play Undertale. Play Undertale. Like, comment, and subscribe. Listen to the soundtrack. The best song is Death by Glamour. Death by Glamour. Um, I have lots of, of personal favorites and ones that hit me emotionally, uh, but in terms of songs that make me just go, oh my God, this song is so incredible, Death by Glamour rules so hard. Enjoy video games and life to the fullest. Yeah, man. Uh, stay determined. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Don't tell me what to do. I just did. <laughs> <laughs>